Good evening and welcome to tonight's driver's ed class. We'll wait a few minutes as we normally do for people to sign in to get logged on. So remember to sign in with your phone too, so I know that you're here. Good evening, good evening, good evening. We're getting up there, almost to a full class. Okay, one of the things that I asked you to do, I sent out with a Facebook message about tonight's class that I included a PDF file in our Facebook group of a sign test that I wanted you to take. Um, tonight's class is going to be about sign signals and pavement markings. And the reason why I wanted you to take this, I call it a quiz, uh, beforehand it, it's really important for you to try to see if you have some basic knowledge. It's kind of like what the pretest did the uh, second class of, of what you basically know. Because a lot of people think they know more about signs than they actually do. Okay. Um, in the comments on YouTube, put down whether you thought this was difficult or not. So write down in the comments you thought it was easy or hard okay uh, if you didn't download it I want you to uh, try to download it as quickly as you can uh, try to go along because we're going to start off the class kind of looking at that test and then I'm going to explain it so this is what you should have had sent to you okay now this is what I want you to do for those of you that have downloaded it uh, so you can take a look at it. Let's get out of the music here. They're giving you, this is a matching test. Now, the reason why I like giving tests like this is that it does come out to logic because you really have all the answers right in front of you. So do you have the reasoning skills and the logic to figure out how to match these signs correctly? Okay. So let's take a look. Let's take a look and see. Hard, hard, hard. Everybody thought it was hard. Okay, Kate didn't think it was too, too bad. Okay, this is what I want you to do if you have this with me. If you don't have it with you, what I want you to do is to write this down, okay? So... Let me put it, I'm going to see if I can throw this on the screen. Let's see if I can throw this. Boom. There we go. Okay. Take a look at your possible signs to use on those meanings down below. So there are 30 meanings and you have to use those nine signs. So watch. Sign A, sign C, sign E, sign G, and sign I only have one meaning. That sign is a very specific sign, and we're going to go through these tonight, and they only mean one thing, 
Okay, so now we have four signs left. Sign D and sign F are the same color. Now, if you did your reading, you know that orange is a color that designates construction. So if the meaning down below, like um, 9 and 10, those are construction meanings. So you're going to use D and F on like 9 and 10, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the rest of the quiz was between sign B and sign H. And if you did your reading, once again, we know that yellow is a warning sign. And we know that H is a white sign, and a white sign deals with laws. So this test was really between two signs once you did the construction meanings and then use those other signs that had one meaning, the other five that only had one meaning, it should have been a very simple quiz to take. So I am going to go over um, what the answers are so you can self-correct. So we're going to get this right out of the way. And those of you that didn't do it, um, I'm going to go over this so quick, you're not going to be able to figure it out anyway. So you can come back to the video later and see what the answers are. So I'm going to go through it really quick. Okay. Um, number one is H. That's a law. Two. Okay. Bump. That is a warning. Okay. So that's a B. That's a yellow warning sign. Same thing with a dead end. Three. B. Okay. It's warning you what's up ahead. Detour. Deals with construction. That is going to be F. Now, the difference between a, a the D construction and the F is that a diamond shape, which is D, is a warning. F is guiding you, all right? So, 4 is guiding you. So, that's F. 5 is D because it's warning you. How, how many feet do you get to the detour? Six, divided highway is B. Seven, do not enter is G. Eight, do not pass is H. End of construction, that is guiding you. So that's F. Ten, flagman, 500 feet, that is D. That is warning you how close they are from where you're at. Now we're going to get a lot of B's and H's. Eleven. Hill, B, 12, left-hand turn is H. That is at a traffic light. If you did put B, I'll give you credit because some warning signs will show you that the road is bending um, to the left, but it's not really a left turn, okay? Uh, no parking anytime, 13 is H. 14, no passing zone is C. 15, no turn on red is H. 16, no turn or no U-turn is H. 17, pass with care is H. 18, road machinery ahead is D. 19, road narrows is B. 20, slippery when wet, that's a warning. Soft shoulder is a warning, that's B. Speed limit is H. Hopefully nobody got 20 three wrong. If you got 23 wrong and you need more than driver's ed. Uh, 24, stop ahead. That's B. Stop for school bus. That is a warning. That's a B. Stop here on red. 26 is H. That's a law. Same thing with a truck group. If you know where uh, Red Shoe Barn in Dover is, they have a truck route sign. They also have a truck route sign on Silver Street in Dover. So these signs are around. I think some of you probably looked at some of these um, uh, descriptions and you go, I have no idea what a truck route is. It's probably because you weren't paying attention while your parents were driving. Now it's your turn to get behind the wheel and you're going to have to remember these things. 28, two-way traffic is B. 29, wrong way is I. And 30, is yield is E. 
Now, if this was for your driver's license, if we talked about uh, early this week about going for your uh, license test, we know that you've got 40 questions. So this was 30, so that means you can only miss six. So if you missed more than six, you wouldn't have passed your driver's test. But the nice thing about the driver's test, only 10 questions will be specifically on signs. Now, I want you to write this down because this is coming up next week. Uh, next week, we'll be at our halfway point. We'll be taking our midterm. Your midterm will be something, at least part of it, something like what we just did right here. Okay? You're going to do a lot of signs. So hopefully after tonight's class, this will make a little bit more sense to you and you'll be able to use that reasoning and logic that we talked about to kind of come up with what your answers should be. So let's get right into tonight's class, signs, signals, and pavement markings. How to make sense of the road ahead for safe travel. Now, this is in Durham. It's pretty close to the junior high. For those of you that don't live in Durham, this is where it's located. The reason why I took this picture is that we've got um, a couple things that we have to pay attention to as we're driving. First thing that we're going to be coming upon is the arrow. So road markings. Second thing, we have a stop sign. Okay, we can turn right, we can go straight, we can turn left. The other thing that I want you to see is that there's a crosswalk. Now, as we talked about last night with inattention blindness, is that you could be focusing on the stop sign and you're working on slowing down and stopping, but what would happen if right now we're in the lane to go straight or turn right? Uh, the midterm is going to probably be Tuesday. That's what it's on your sheet. Remember, look at your syllabus. I gave you a folder where everything is. I think we're going to move it to um, after parking. We're going to drop it down. I don't know if we'll get through everything tonight on sign signals, payment markings. So we're going to have to push maybe a little bit back the next couple days. So it's it could be Monday. Um, if not Monday, definitely Tuesday. But it's not going into a Wednesday or Thursday. So that's the answer to the question, whoever popped it up. And I don't mind. I don't mind if you ask questions while I'm, you know, uh, talking. That's the only way that I'm going to be able to get you the information. But back to the picture. You, if you're in the right lane right now, so if you're only focusing on the stop sign and you really want to make a left-hand turn, you are not where you need to be. So you've got to be processing this information a little bit quicker and, and not missing any vital information. There's a whole lot of information that is out there on signs. And what we have here, it's kind of confusing. It says no parking to the left, but to the right, it says you can park for 15 minutes. But then they give you a time frame when you can do it. And then down below it, it says that this side of the street, there's no parking on the second and the fourth Tuesday of the month. It's like, there's, it's too confusing. But the signs do explain things for us. So what I'm trying to say is the signs are there, can be a little bit confusing to look at and figure out real quick. So take your time, and this isn't a parking lot anyway, so you're not going to be processing all this while you're moving, but take your time to know what you need to do. There's no reason why you should have your vehicle towed um, if you parked on a Tuesday um, the second Tuesday of the month, because there's a sign telling you that you can't do it. Read the signs. And by the way, if they tow your vehicle, at least let's use Durham as an example, it's going to cost you close to $100. I mean, that's a big mistake to make by not reading a sign. This is what I want you to write down. So remember, only write down what I tell you because it's important and it will probably come up again. Okay, these four things, everything dealing with signs and signals can be broken up into these four categories. Color. So in your notes, write down, there are only seven colors. That's not a lot to remember, but you should remember what each color means. And we're going to go through each one. 
We're only going to go through basic shapes tonight, but in the manual, in the textbook, it really goes a little bit more involved on um, what your signs are or shapes are for your signs. Now, three regulatory and four is warning. Every sign is either going to be a law or it's going to be a warning. So regulatory really means law. Like a, a stop sign is a regulatory sign. Speed limit, regulatory sign. Those parking signs that I showed you just on the previous slide, those are regulatory. A warning will be yellow, orange, blue, green. Um, all these signs, it's not a law. It's just giving you some helpful information to get you to where you want to go safely. So the question that I'm going to pose to you, you don't have to answer it on YouTube or on your phone, but I want you to think about it in your head and see if you get it right. What is the most important color to be looking out for? What is the most important color to be looking out for? Now, if you said red, you would be correct. Red is the most important color sign that we have out there because it tells us to either stop or not to do something. So we have two examples here. We have our typical stop sign, and then below it, we have a picture of an off-ramp. And the off-ramp has two signs telling us that we should not be going in that direction. Now, even if those signs weren't there, let's say that it's heavy fog or it's snow and the snow is adhering to these signs, you still have arrows on the pavement. So at least that's going to help you out, okay? Now, with the stop sign up above, let me explain how to handle a stop sign. So write this down. This is important. We kind of talked about um, legal stop and safety stop, I think, in a previous class. But what I want you to write down, if you cannot see a stop line, the white line. Now, notice in the picture, it's probably about six to seven feet in front of the stop sign. So do you stop at the sign or the line? You stop at the line. That's why it's painted there. If they wanted you to stop at the sign, they would have painted the line there. Okay, You make your first stop at the white line. You want your bumper even with it, but you don't want to go beyond it, especially on your driving test. Now, here where it gets a little tricky. If you can't see the white line, it's faded, maybe they didn't paint it, then always have your front bumper with the post of the stop sign. That is called your legal stop. Now, let's say you stop at that stop sign and you look to the left and you can't see. Well, then you're going to have to inch forward. And when you inch forward, that is called a safety stop. But you don't want to go way beyond a stop sign unless there's a line up there. You want to stop at the sign and then move forward. So what's the difference between a rolling stop and a resting stop? And I did have a video, and I'm looking out the window. I wish I could just take the camera um, that's really on top of my desktop and point it out the window right now, because I am looking, right now I am looking at a car making a left-hand turn. And they are stopped, they've got their left directional on, and they made a, a decent turn. But the person right before that car rolled right through the stop sign in front of my house. I, I see it constantly, okay? So the difference between a rolling stop and a resting stop is, write this down, is that you can feel the pitch of the vehicle. The car is pitching forward, okay? And then it's coming back. So if, the, if you look at tires, if you look at a car that's coming up to a stop sign, if the tires just keep on rolling, they keep on moving forward, that's a rolling stop. And you don't want to do that. This is what I'm looking at right now. This is um, not exactly right out my window, but this is the intersection that is right out my window. And people run that stop line that's to the left all the time, all the time. If we have a little bit of time, maybe I'll turn the camera around if I can. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, back here. In Durham, this is the picture that we had earlier. Um, what I wanted to point out here is notice that you have a stop sign on the left. 
you don't usually see signs posted on the left side of the road. Yes. Uh, for, for Grant, can you feel the pitch for a rolling stop or a resting stop? You can for the resting stop, but you can't feel it for the rolling stop because there was no, there was no completion of the car stopping. When there's a completion to the car stopping, Grant, it does feel, you feel a little nudge. Let me get out. I'm going to go back to me for a minute. So when there is a little bit of, of a resting stop, your body is going to go forward just like I am right now. It's, it's going to be very subtle, but everybody in the car is going to go like this and then come back. But on a rolling stop, there, there won't be any difference. Like right now, I'm not going to move and I'm going to roll right through. There won't be any movement of my body. So back to the stop sign here. Um, I want you to write down your notes. Is that when you have a one-way street, which we're on, you're going to probably have a stop sign on the left-hand side of the road because your left lane needs to see that. Because if traffic is really backed up in this right lane that we're in right now, and they didn't have that stop sign to the left, Maybe a vehicle or a truck that's sitting up pretty high is going to block that stop sign to the right. So if you're making a left-hand turn, you may think, oh, I don't have a stop sign. I can just keep on going. Well, it's hidden by traffic. So be very careful when you're on a one-way street. Uh, look for your stop line. Look for your sign. Uh, and watch out for cars blocking the information that you need to see. Now... You want to show your parents that you're learning something in driver's ed. Ask them this question tonight, or if they're close by, ask your parents with a white sign, how many subcategories do we have for a white sign? Most people will always say a white sign means law. They've got that basically down, and they always give the example of a speed limit sign. So ask your parents how many different meanings does a white sign have and it has three because if you look at a white sign and i've got it up here on the on the slide there's white with black white with red and white with green each one means something different but it is a law okay this will show your parents you're really you're getting something so let's explain what they mean okay white with black like i said the, the one that everybody gives Speed limit. So white with black is telling you to do something. Now let's go to white with red. White with red is telling you not to do something. Makes sense, doesn't it? Red is universal for stop or prohibition. So the question is, what does a white sign with green mean? It's guiding you to what is legal. And if you take a look at the sign... You can park Monday through Friday between 8 and 5 for only two hours. But if you were to park there Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, you could keep your car there all night long and you'd have to move it Thursday morning by 10 o'clock because the two-hour limit is going to start at 8 in the morning and you better move it by 10. If you don't, you're going to get a ticket. So it's guiding you to what's legal and what's not legal. Most people didn't know that. Um, blue. Most people know that blue signs, um, the universal sign that we know about blue is handicap. That's the one that everybody gives. But there are a whole bunch of motor services that will show up on a blue sign. So let me just mention a few that we have on the upper picture. We have gas. We have food. We have lodging. We have telephone. We have camping. Um, hospital would be on a blue sign. Pharmacy would be, pharmacy, write this down, RX. Okay, and RX is pharmacy. Um, library, okay, that's a service. So that would be marked by blue sign. And most of the time we see a blue sign on a highway. Although sometimes we may see it in town if you're getting close to it, like for a hospital. Yellow is the most common type of sign that we have out on the road. 
It's always just giving you warnings. And just like the white sign, it can be broken down into two categories. The regular yellow, which is the top picture, and then the bottom picture is of a school crossing um, or a pedestrian crossing. Anything dealing with school or pedestrians will be a neon yellow sign. So that's the difference in color. And most people never really thought about it that way. If we were in class, and there's, I think, 23 or 24 of you, um, we would go around um, and you would have to give me an example of a yellow sign. Most people, when I call on them, they get all nervous and they go, oh, I don't know any more yellow signs. There are so many yellow signs. I mean, Animal Crossing, a bend in the road to the right, a street to the left, a playground, traffic light up ahead, uh, slippery when wet. Um, it could warn you for your speed tables. There, there are a whole bunch of yellow signs that are out there on the road, so you've got to really be paying attention to those. Now, here's a yellow sign on top of a law. So it's warning you, and we talked about the neon, so we've got it over on the picture to the right, but we don't. For some reason, they've got the old yellow up top. But notice the difference in speed. And we're going to talk about um, different speed zones in schools because here's the easiest answer. Whatever the speed limit on the road is, subtract 10 miles per hour. That's the speed limit you have to go by a school. It's always dropping your speed by 10. And notice the picture to the left. It's always 45 minutes before school. So from 9.15 to 9 o'clock. And then after school, it goes for another 45 minutes. So 2.45 to 3.30. And notice it's only on school days. It's not on holidays, not during the weekend. It's not right now because you're not in school, even though you're kind of in school with online. Green is direction or guidance, usually found mostly up on the highway. Thought this was kind of a interesting sign. Um, my nephew lives out on the West Coast. And uh, if, if you wanted to go from, I believe this is out in Washington or Oregon somewhere, you could get to Boston, Massachusetts just following Route 20. Heading east, it's going to take you 3,365 miles. So that road goes all the way across the upper part of our country, which I thought was kind of cool. Who would think of a road or a route number being that long? But that's giving you information. Brown signs deal with recreation. This is the least, this is the sign that you see the least out on the roadway. Okay. Um, so this is Hilton Park. This is down near the testing site. And that's what the blue sign is indicating. So we got three colors here. We've got uh, Boston Harbor telling you the road that you're on. You've got Hilton Park telling you you've got a recreational area. And then you've got your motor vehicle sign telling you that you've got your substation. And then orange uh, is construction like we had on the quiz. And notice the difference between the... Um, diamond shape, and the guide warning that you have. Okay, traffic signals. When we take a look at a traffic light, it goes from top to bottom. Red is at the top, yellow, then green. I'm going to get out of this for a second and show you something. So the question is, why is, why is red on top? Okay, what I want you to put down in your notes, it is the most important color to see. So right now I'm going to put this book in front of my face. So at the top of my head would be where the red light is. So if you're following following behind a large truck, the truck is blocking your sight. So as you're following the truck and get closer to the light, see now you get to see the red light, the yellow light, and then of course green being at the bottom. So it's always best to know when to stop. It's not really even, I mean, it's good to know you can go, but you really you want to not miss your, your red lights. And the reason why we've got yellow is letting you know there is a little bit of a, of a lag before you go from green to red. 
So the minute it goes green to yellow, you better know whether you're going to go through it or whether you're going to stop. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. So there's your, your traffic light. Now, I've always told my classes, if you look at this picture, what color is the light? Now, there are half the people that will say it's yellow. Half the people will say it's red or orange. And by the way, there is no orange light. It's either going to be yellow or red. But what I'm trying to show you here is that we have to know for sure. Remember we talked about color blindness, where they're not getting the true representation of the color? Well, that's what we have here. It looks yellow. It looks kind of orange, but it is the red light. You have to know that. So don't let your eyes deceive you. How about this? You talk about confusing. What do you do here? Now, this, I believe, is over either in England or France. But this is not an actual traffic light. They took a whole bunch of traffic lights and they formed a sculpture. Now, I believe, and if you look at the picture real close, it looks like some blurry lines. And I hope that's not cars that have gone by. Because if I saw this, I'd be totally confused by it at first. Okay, I think it's playing havoc on drivers if that's not truly, uh, if, if it's in a park where cars can't see it, then yeah, that's kind of cool. But if it's really close by a, car, a roadway or intersection, my first reaction would be breaking and what in the world did they do here? What does this mean? So always think out what you, what you see. Now, rather than going into explaining how traffic lights work, and this is a whole paragraph telling you how traffic lights work, Basically, there's a magnetic field underneath the pavement that it senses when a car is going over it. So when no more cars are going over that area, if there are cars waiting left or right at a stop line, then the light is going to change. So to give you some idea what it looks like, uh, here is a video that does a much better job explaining it than I could. If you live in a major city, I can take a pretty good guess at one of your most common frustrations, traffic. In city driving, the journey is rarely better than the destination. In most cases, we just want to get where we're going. Traffic is not just frustrating, but it has consequences to the environment as well. All those idling vehicles have an impact on air quality. When you're stuck and sitting behind a long line of cars, it's easy to let your mind wander over solutions to our traffic woes. But traffic management in dense urban areas is an extremely complex problem with a host of conflicting goals and challenges. One of the most fundamental of those challenges happens at an intersection, where multiple streams of traffic, including vehicles, bikes, and pedestrians, need to safely, and with any luck, efficiently cross each other's paths. Over the years, we've developed quite a few ways to manage this challenge of who gets to go and who gets to wait, from simple signs to roundabouts, but one of the most common ways we control the right-of-way at intersections is the traffic signal. I'm Grady and this is Public Works, my video series on infrastructure and the human-made world around us. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later. There are a lot of good analogies between cities and human anatomy, and roadways are no exception. Highways are like the aorta, with a high capacity and single major destination. Small collector roads are like the capillaries, with not much capacity, but a connection to every individual house and business. And in between are the aptly named arterial roadways, the medium capacity connections between urban centers. Rather than ramps, overpasses, and access roads to control the flow of traffic, arterial roads use at-grade intersections, through which only a few traffic streams can pass at a time. We call this interrupted traffic flow for obvious reasons. In most cases, these intersections are the limit to the maximum throughput of the roadway. In other words, increasing the number of lanes or speed limit won't have any effect on the overall capacity of the road. The only way to increase the number of vehicles that safely travel from point A to B is to increase the efficiency of the intersection. In addition, these intersections are where a vast majority of accidents occur. For these reasons, traffic engineers put a lot of thought and analysis into the design of intersections and how to make them as safe and efficient as possible. 
Controlling the flow of traffic through an intersection, otherwise known as assigning right-of-way, is an enormous challenge and almost always requires a compromise of numerous conflicting considerations, including space, cost, approach speed, cycle time, site distance, types and volumes of traffic, and human factors like habits, expectations, and reaction times. Intersections also need to be rigidly standardized so that when you come to an unfamiliar one, you already know your role in the careful and chaotic dance of vehicles and pedestrians. From a throughput standpoint, the ideal intersection would cause no interruption to flow whatsoever, but you can't put a high five interchange on every city block. On the other hand, simple signs are cost effective and don't require any extra space, but they can't handle a lot of volume because they create an interruption for every single vehicle passing through the intersection. You can see why traffic signals are so popular. They aren't a panacea for all traffic problems, but they do offer a very nice balance of the considerations we discussed before. Relatively low cost, minimal space requirements, and the ability to handle large volumes of traffic with only some interruption. In their simplest form, traffic signals are a set of three lights facing each lane of an intersection. When the light is green, that lane has the right of way to cross. When the light is red, they don't. The amber light warns that the signal is about to change from green to red. Beyond this basic function, traffic signals can take on innumerable complexities to accommodate all kinds of situations. Let's take a look at a typical intersection here in the US to show how they work. At each approach to an intersection, there are three directions vehicles can go, called movements, right, through, or left. Right and through are usually grouped together as a single movement, so a typical four-way intersection has eight vehicle and four pedestrian movements. These movements can be grouped into phases of the traffic signal. For example, the left turn movements on opposite approaches can be grouped into a single phase because they can both go at the same time without conflicts. Traffic engineers use a ring and barrier diagram to sketch out how different phases of the signal are allowed to operate. Here's the ring and barrier diagram for our example intersection. The first phase is the major street left turns. Then the major street vehicle and pedestrian through movements. A barrier to clear the intersection. The minor street left turns. The minor street vehicle and pedestrian through movements. And finally, another barrier before the cycle starts again. Hi, I'm Rex Moore with The Motley Fool in front of BMW's self-driving exhibit. There are an endless variety of phasing arrangements that traffic engineers use to accommodate various intersection configurations and traffic volumes for each movement. Even the simple decision of whether to use protected or unprotected left turns takes a significant amount of analysis and consideration. Another important decision is how long each sequence of a phase should last. Ideally, a green light should last at least long enough to clear the queue that built up during the red light. This isn't always possible, especially during peak times on busy intersections. In these cases where the intersection is saturated, the green light might be extended for each phase to minimize the startup and clearance times, which are periods when the intersection isn't being utilized to its maximum capacity. The amber light needs to last long enough for a driver to perceive the warning and decelerate their vehicle to a stop at a comfortable rate. One second for every 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers per hour on the speed limit is a general rule of thumb. But traffic engineers also take into account the slope of the approach and other local considerations when setting the timing for yellow lights. In most places in North America, you're allowed to enter an intersection for the full duration of a yellow light, which means there needs to be a time when all phases have a red light to allow the intersection to clear. This clearance interval is usually about a second, but can be adjusted up or down based on the speed limit and intersection size. So far, we've only been talking about signals on a set timing sequence, but most traffic signals these days are more sophisticated than that. Actuated signal control is the term we use for signals that can receive input from the outside and use that information to make decisions about light timing and sequence on the fly. These type of signals rely on data from traffic detection systems. These sensors can be embedded cameras or radars, but most commonly they're inductive loop sensors embedded into the road surface. They are essentially large metal detectors which simply measure whether or not a car or truck is present, sometimes to the annoyance of bicycle, scooters, and motorcycles that may be too small to trigger the loop. Whatever the type of sensor, they all feed data into an equipment cabinet located nearby. You've probably seen hundreds of these cabinets without realizing their purpose. Inside this cabinet is a traffic signal controller, 
essentially a simple computer that is programmed with specific logic to determine when and how long each light will last based on the information from the detectors. Actuated control gives a traffic signal much more flexibility to handle variations in traffic load. For example, if a nearby road is closed and traffic rerouted through a signal that doesn't normally see such high demand, it may need to be reprogrammed before the closure. A light equipped with actuated control will simply see the additional traffic and adjust its phasing accordingly. Same thing with special events like concerts and sports games that create huge traffic demands on irregular schedules, and even seasonal changes in traffic like in major tourist destinations. Actuated systems can also keep you from waiting at a long light when no one's crossing in the other direction. Finally, actuated control can help by giving priority to emergency vehicles and public transportation by using specialized detectors like infrared or acoustic sensors that communicate directly with certain types of vehicles. But actuated control isn't the end of the complexity. After all, it still treats each intersection as an isolated entity, when in reality each signal is a component of a larger traffic network. And each component of the traffic network can have an impact, sometimes a major impact, on other components in the system. Take the classic example of two signals closely spaced in a row on a major roadway. If one signal gives a green but the next one doesn't, cars can back up. If they back up far enough, they can sit through multiple cycles at an intersection without being able to pass through until the light beyond clears. It's a frustrating experience for anyone. A signal is inadvertently, but significantly, reducing the capacity of an adjacent signal. One solution to this problem is signal coordination, where lights can not only consider the traffic waiting at their intersection, but also the status of nearby signals. This is a very common configuration on long corridors with relatively minor but frequent cross streets. The signals on the major road are timed so that a large group of vehicles, called a platoon by traffic engineers, can make it all the way through the corridor without interruption. This type of signal coordination can significantly increase the volume of traffic that can pass through intersections, but it really only works on stretches of road that don't have other sources of traffic interruptions, like driveways and businesses. If the platoon can't stick together, the benefits of coordinating signals mostly gets lost. The obvious next step in efficiency is coordination of most or all the signals within a traffic network. This is the job of Adaptive Signal Control Technologies, or ASCT. In adaptive systems, rather than individual groups of lights, all the information from detectors is fed into a centralized system that can use advanced algorithms like machine learning to optimize traffic flow throughout the city. These types of systems can dramatically reduce congestion, but they're only just starting to be implemented in major urban areas. As sensors become more ubiquitous and computing power increases, traffic management may slowly but surely be relegated from civil engineers to software developers and data scientists. On the complete opposite side of centralization, many believe that self-driving cars are the next revolution in traffic management. If every vehicle could communicate and coordinate with every other vehicle on the road, interrupted traffic control could eventually become a thing of the past. But don't get your hopes too high. In dense urban areas, traffic congestion is often self-limiting. Especially during peak times, for every one person on the road, there are many more at work or at home waiting for the congestion to clear up before they head out. This latent traffic demand means that any increase in capacity will quickly be filled up with more traffic, bringing the congestion back to the same level it was before. Katera was really formed because Wow, pretty technical stuff, but hopefully you have a better understanding of how traffic moves through traffic lights. And one of the terms that they used was cars that are grouped together are considered a platoon. Now, as I mentioned, is that in rural New Hampshire, we do have some of this technology. It senses when this platoon has gone through a traffic light, and if there is a hesitation of three to four seconds of nobody else going through the intersection, it's going to change for the other person to the right or to the left of you. So that's what you basically need to remember. If I have a car that's way in front of me and it's a green light, there's a good chance that I'm not close enough to that car to keep the light green. It will change. And when you start driving with me and we're driving around Durham and Dover and Portsmouth, I'll point this out. I'll let you know. I'll say, watch the traffic light. It's going to change within the next couple of seconds. And within about 80% of the time, I'm usually 
pretty spot on of guessing when lights are going to change because I've been doing this for so long. Now, in between, it's very hard to see in this picture, but between the two red lights that are overhanging the car that's in front of us, if you, if you really can't see it, there's another little tiny red light. And I want you to write this down. It's called an Opticom. That's what's at the top of the slide. An Opticom light will come on. It will start flashing red. It's indicating that an emergency vehicle is soon approaching. So at that point, you should be turning down the radio, listening for where you hear the siren coming from, because sometimes it's hard to tell. And you're going to be looking for the emergency lights, looking your side mirrors, rear view mirror, looking straight ahead. Now, normally we're going to have to move over to the right. So if we can at this point, and it looks like the lane to the left is open, we would move over to the right. The cars to the left of us would move over into the lane that we're in. That's going to leave an empty area for the emergency vehicle if it's coming from behind. Now, if the emergency vehicle is coming towards us, we still move over to the right a little bit, but it's more of a concern of the other lane of traffic where the emergency vehicle is coming from the other direction. Um, I want you to write this down in your notes. It is legal in every single state in the country to turn right on red. Turning right on red means that you come to a stop at the stop line at the traffic light. You look for a sign that will indicate that it's illegal. If there is no sign indicating it's illegal, if there is no crosswalk sign or a, a countdown, you know how there's a number counting down? As long as there's no blinking hand or a countdown, we can legally turn right on red. Now, when you go to a different state, even though it's legal in every state, some metropolitan areas like parts of New York and probably Washington, D.C., uh, depending if it's a one-way or two-way road, you're going to see signs or they're just going to blanketly make it illegal to do within that particular city. I think Montreal, of course, that's not United States, but um, I don't think you can turn right on red in Montreal. So come up to speed on traffic law as you start driving in different area, areas. But in New Hampshire, you can turn right on red. Now, the other thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to, if the person in front of you stops, and is turning right on red, you don't want to follow with them and say, well, I was stopped behind him, so I'm going to go with them. Everybody has to stop at the stop line and feel that pitch, then go. So it's almost like a turnstile in a subway. One person goes through, then the next person comes up and makes the, the, the gate go forward. So same thing with a right on red. When traffic lights don't work, write this down. Always obey the controls of a police officer. A police officer overrules stop signs, traffic lights. They now become the governing controller of that intersection. So whatever they tell you to do, you've got to obey. Now, why wouldn't a traffic light work? Could be an electrical storm, could be in the winter time, could be someone hitting a telephone pole and the power supply goes down. It could be numerous things. If there's no police officer around, write this down, to help control the traffic, treat it like a four-way stop. If the lights go out, there's no police officer, everybody has to treat the traffic light like a stop sign, like a four-way stop. Uh, light turns green. We know that uh, we try to stay in the lane that we're turning. Um, you got to be careful uh, because if you have two turning lanes, you're not supposed to go out of your lane into another lane unless you've used your signal and checked your mirrors and blind spot. Um, but know where you're going. Okay, Don't blindly go into a turn and not know where your position. Remember we talked about the center position, right of center, left of center, far right, far left. You've got to 
approach the traffic light, set your vehicle up to make a decent turn to the right or to the left. Uh, light on yellow. Let me get to this. Point of no return. Okay, write this down. At some point, okay, you, you, you're looking down the road and the light's green and you say in your head, well, it's been green for a while. It's going to change soon. If I get to that crack in the road, if I get to that sign, then I'm going to go through. What you're doing is you've already predetermined that you're going to go through when you get to a particular point. And it's based upon your speed and knowing what you have for stopping distance left. Okay. If you look up at a traffic light, as you're driving, if you look up at the traffic light and it was yellow, but as you're going underneath the intersection, you're looking up and you see that it's a red light. Let me get out of this for a second. If you're driving and you look look up and you see a red light, you are you are going through the intersection when it's red. It the red light is supposed to be when you're right underneath it or it's supposed to be behind you. Let me show you a situation um, where it's So we're waiting for the traffic light to change. And this is right near the field house. We're heading south back into Durham. It's heavy traffic behind motorcycles or scooters, giving them plenty of distance. Now, what you'll notice is as we get closer to the traffic light, the light's gonna change yellow yellow we never saw the light turn red that is the appropriate way to go through a traffic light if that light had turned red and we were to see it we are legally running a red light that means we were either traveling too fast or we didn't get to the brake in the right amount of time to stop the vehicle so always know what's behind you because you don't want to stop real quick I'd much rather have you go through the yellow that's just turning red than to slam on your brakes and then get hit from behind. But if you're paying attention, you have decent speed, you should be able to handle it correctly about 80, 90% of the time. I think most of you would have to admit that you've probably been in a car with your, your mom, your dad, or a friend uh, recently, and you probably saw them go through a red light. Put that in your uh, comments and YouTube. Let's see how many people have been in a car within the last month. We'll, we'll just keep it to a month. How many people have been in a car and they've seen the light turn red as someone's gone through? That's just meaning they're not paying attention or they're going too fast. Lights with arrows. We call those protected turns. So write that down. Anything that has a green arrow is a protected turn. Could be right or left. That means no other traffic is going to be going in that direction. If it's a red arrow, like we have here, we've got to obey the sign that's up above. No turn on a red arrow, so we've got to wait for the green arrow. Now, if that sign wasn't there, just as we said earlier, we can stop, then turn right on red, because it would be legal if the sign wasn't there. This is the other question that I want you to ask your parents. Let's see if you could trip your parents up on this one. Ask your parents, when can you turn left on a red light? All right. Ask your parents, if they're right in the room or close by, ask somebody, when can you turn left on a red light? I bet you they get it wrong. They're going to say never. You can turn left on a red light. But here's the key. Okay, write this down. It has to be a blinking light. It has to be a blinking light. The only time that you can turn left on a red light, it's flashing. It's flashing. And I wish I had a video so I could show it to you. But I don't have one. Now, let's talk about what would happen if you went through a red light. Always look for traffic as you go through. Now... This I couldn't find. I had this loaded uh, in my PowerPoint and I couldn't find the original, so I couldn't pull it out. 
but I want to show you what happens at traffic intersections where people think, oh, it's not a big deal that I go through a red light. Watch what you'll see in these videos with people going through a red light. So hopefully I'll, I'll talk you through these and they're going to progressively get worse as we go along. Okay. That was, look at that. That's about three seconds. By the way, that's a display stop line. See the lane to the left. It's about eight feet past. That's for cars making wide turns. So let's count when the light turns red and how many people are going through. So one, two, three, four seconds and he's going through that red light. So the light had been red for four seconds and he's still going through it. Almost got hit. One, two, three, four. Look at that. Near miss. So when you're the first car going through, you should always hesitate and look to the left because that is where you're going to be hit from first. Always look left when you go through a green light, when you're the first one going through that green light. Always look left. Now here they're going to split between cars. That's crazy. This is why you have to hesitate. You've got to make sure people are doing the right thing at a green light. There are a lot of people doing the wrong thing. Look at this one. It goes right around a stopped vehicle. The car in front of him stopped. He was probably too close and he knew that he was going to hit the car from behind. So rather than hit the car, he went around and went through the red light. But someone could have been going through a green light. I like this one because here's a person running a red light and he figures the truck is bigger than he is and he goes, oh, I better not do this. I'm going to get hit and he's bigger than me. Ah, there's our first crash. Notice the car to the right that stopped. He was probably blocking that, that SUV that started to make the turn. Couldn't see the car that was running the light. Here's wet weather. I think the bus kind of blocked their view. They couldn't see very well. Now for my favorite. I think number two is worse than number one. So in your comments, tell me if you think which one is worse, number one or number two. So I think this one's the worst. Here's a guy running a red light and he's hitting a pedestrian that should not be crossing. We got two people doing the totally wrong thing. Now, this is bad, but by no means do I feel it is as bad as number two. Hitting a school bus is not a good thing, but there are, I don't think there's any kids in it, and it looks like the car got the worst of it. I would not want to be that pedestrian, and just for good measure, they're going to show you. Now, these were cameras. Um, write this down in your notes. It's called photo enforcement. Photo enforcement means that the reason why we're seeing these videos is there are cameras around and they're taking pictures of people doing the wrong thing. So most of these people that are running red lights, see that red car almost hits the bus? Uh, he's going to get his ticket in the mail. That's called photo enforcement. So we're going to take a look at the same intersection, but now from the opposite direction. So there's the bus to the right. You'll notice in the lane um, coming towards us, there's the car doing the right thing. See, he's stopping, but there's the car running through the red light. Okay. Um, inattention blindness probably uh, plays a, a big uh, factor. Yeah. See, you, you all agree with me, number two being the worst. So uh, red light cameras do work. So don't think you're getting away with um, not getting a ticket. And a lot of people will do, will always do the wrong thing, uh, believing that there won't be uh, people around. The other thing that I, I want to mention, and the more that you drive in a city, is that we've got bicycle lanes now. And bicycle lanes are now starting to get their own traffic lights because legally... 
bicycles are supposed to obey the same rules that automobiles do, but we find that they don't. So they figured if they gave bicyclists their own bicycle lane and we gave them a traffic light, maybe they'll do the right thing. I, I, I wish that we were actually in class so we could uh, discuss this because I, I'll have to admit when I was younger, I didn't follow traffic law when I was in a bicycle. I'd go through stop signs and red lights if no traffic was coming. But think about it. You're on a bicycle. You're not protected with any metal around you. Most of the time, you don't have a helmet on. Why would you be doing something that would, they would consider dangerous, like go through a red light? Whereas you could be in a car totally protected with airbags and your seatbelt on. There's nobody else on the road but you but you're waiting for a red light to turn the green so you can go through. But a bicycle may come right up beside you and go right through that same red light. It just baffles me. I, don't, I just don't see why, why bikes think that they can do that. I've totally changed my mind now that I'm a driver's ed teacher. Some of you will get an opportunity in your lifetime to drive in another country. Uh, we have used international colors and signs to mean the same thing. So when you do go to another country, it'd be uh, pretty easy to pick it up. Um, I did have the opportunity to drive in Italy for just a little bit. Um, it is different, of course, kilometers rather than miles per hour, but that's easy to pick up. But we do know the sign up above means taxi, and it also means do not enter. So those signs are pretty symbolic of what we have here. Pretty easy to figure out. Now, sometimes signs can be a little bit confusing. So when you take a look at this sign, or even look at the person driving the vehicle, wait a minute, he's not on the correct side of that vehicle. I took a picture from my side view mirror. If you look at the bottom left corner, you could see a little bit of the bottom. So I was stopped and um, I had my camera out on my lap and um, I was taking pictures, getting pictures for... Um, I guess part of this presentation, this was years and years ago, probably like 10 years ago. But remember, I want, want you to write this down. Mirrors give you an opposite image. If you ever take a look at the word ambulance on an ambulance, it is spelt backwards in the front. So when you look in your rear view mirror and they're coming up behind you, we talked about emergency vehicles a little earlier then basically we would be able to read it correctly. Cause if not, you'd be kind of confused. Why is that guy got a siren on behind me? It would confuse you. Now here's the future. We talk about uh, technology and what's happening all around. Um, and we talked about cars driving themselves. We are getting some of this technology in the cars that we have. We do have this in the driver's ed vehicle where we know what the speed limit is and it tells you if you're going too fast. So once we get in the car, I'll show it to you. But here's what we have over in Europe. It's getting to be more commonplace over here. While driving, one passes so many traffic signs that sometimes even important information, such as speed limits or no overtaking signs, can get lost. The driver can also sometimes be distracted by traffic and not notice some of the signs. The Ford Traffic Sign Recognition System eliminates this issue by showing important traffic sign information in the instrument panel cluster. On display are speed limits and bands on overtaking, as well as their cancellation. The front camera records the traffic signs and transmits the respective data to the vehicle's traffic sign recognition system. The traffic sign recognition system uses an aging algorithm. This means that recently detected signs appear lighter. After a while, the color gets darker until the signs begin to gray out and finally completely disappear. This helps to make the driver aware of changes in real time. Well, that's a kind of an interesting uh, thing uh, to experience, uh, Katav, about uh, being over in Italy and having someone on the uh, railroad tracks. 
I, I would tend to think that uh, taxi drivers uh, make me a little nervous anyways, but uh, being in another country and having somebody drive, especially in some of those narrow roads uh, in Italy, we'll have to have a talk when we get in the car together about our experience in Italy, about the type of driving they have over there. Let me tell you, it. Uh, I think it uh, made me a little bit more nervous being over there around drivers than around here. Okay, let's get into road markings just a little bit. Um, four things about road markings I want you to write down, and this was in your uh, responsible driving reading. So the first thing I want you to write down is that the line to the left of you will be uh, indicating the direction of traffic. So when you have a yellow line to the left of you as the driver, you know it's oncoming traffic on the opposite side of that yellow line. If you had a white line next to you, whether it be solid or dotted, that is telling you you have another lane to the left of you going in the same direction. So the color of the line in the middle of the road, yellow for two-way traffic, white for one-way. Now, the other thing you need to know is the difference between when you see lines to the left of you that are either solid or if they're dotted. If they are dotted, then we know passing is allowed. Like downtown Durham, we can pass to the right, we can pass to the left. We could do the same thing on the highway, Spalding or 95. But if it was a solid line, and this is, I want you to write this down in your notes, put a little star next to it. This is one of the markoffs when you go for your license test at Dover. The Dover licensing person has told me this, is that too many people are crossing over when they merge on a solid white line on their merge lane. Merging onto the highway, they come into traffic way too early and they cross over a solid white line. So that bottom picture to the left, there's a solid yellow, a white line to the left of you. If you go over that line right now, then you're going to be doing something illegal and that will cause you to fail your driver's test. So, Lines and lanes. The only thing I want you to really write down from this, and I don't, I they mentioned it in the manual on the last part in part six, the last paragraph. It's called a shared turn lane, and it's really called a shared left turn lane. So make sure you write that down. Okay, shared left turn lane. I'm going to try to dig it up in the manual real quick. So if you have your manual, it's on page 24. Okay, this area is telling drivers that the lane can only be used for left-hand turns in either direction. Now, what I want you to also write down is that what would you do if you go into that left turn lane and someone's coming towards you and they want to make a left-hand turn? Okay, this is what I want you to write down. Make sure that you always leave at least a like a car and a half to two car lengths distance between another vehicle that is in that shared turn lane. You never want to go nose to nose, get real close to another car because you just got to give them a little bit of room to be making their left hand turn. Or they got to give you a little bit of room for you to make your left hand turn. You just don't know who's going to who's going to go first. Um this is called reversible lanes. We don't have this in New Hampshire that I'm aware of. The only places could be maybe Nashua uh, or Salem down around the border, but I'm going to say no. I know Manchester does it because uh, I do drive around Manchester more than I do uh, Salem and Nashua. But uh, we do have this in Boston. So, And it's called a zipper lane. So write that down. Zipper lane. Okay, the zipper lane changes in the middle. So right now, in the morning, that shared turn lane that we were talking about has um, people, you know, going into the city. So that is you. So in responsible driving, it talked about staying in the right lane or middle lane where there's a green arrow pointing down. Don't drive in a lane that has a red X over it, or if it has a yellow X or a yellow arrow uh, you can be in that lane temporarily, but you've got to get out of it relatively quickly because it's going to change. And you just never know what time of day 
it's going to change. See how the lane now is going in the opposite direction at night. And as I mentioned, it is called a zipper lane. So let's take a look at the zipper lane in Massachusetts. So my wife was driving. We were going to visit my daughter in Massachusetts. And here is the zipper lane. So here we approach. We're going to make a lane change. We are now going into the zipper lane. That's what the flashing yellow light's indicating. We have what they call jurious, uh, Jersey barriers now. Uh, so we can't leave to the right at all. And that's one of the bad things about getting into the zipper lane is that once we get up a little bit further, you'll see a green guide sign off to the right. If you want that exit, you're not going to be able to get, get to it. You've got to know that you're going to go the whole time in the zipper lane. So where it begins and where it ends, you're stuck. The other thing, see, there's a, a, a green exit sign. So if you wanted that exit, tough luck. You're not, you're not getting it because you're in the zipper lane. Now at night, what they're going to do is they're going to block off um, the beginning part of it and cars will be coming in the opposite direction, like where that bus just came from. So this is in Massachusetts. So that's how they do it with the Jer uh, Jersey barriers. They just kind of move it around. So I thought that was kind of cool to see. Other markings we just mentioned already. The bottom uh, diagram, that uh, black box with the with the white diamond, is the HOV lane. So write that down. I want you to know HOV. HOV is high occupancy vehicle, and that is for somebody that has at least two people in the car. So it's like carpooling. Now the only vehicle that you can be in as a driver and have nobody else in the car, just you driving. Some states allow you to use the HOV lane if you are in a um, hybrid or electric car. So that's one of the benefits, maybe sometimes looking for energy efficiency car, because if you live in the city, they're going to have you have access to that, that faster lane. Interstate systems and state routes, I do want you to know this. So for an interstate, um, odd first number goes north-south. So uh, interstate 17, odd first number goes north-south. An even first number like interstate 80 would go east-west. And they go from the top of the United States down to the bottom. So 95, which is an odd first number, goes from Maine to Florida. Okay, interstate 5 is on the west coast that goes from Washington state all the way down to the bottom of California. Now the green sign down below, we have some three digit state routes. So with an even first number, so 202, an even first number goes through or around a city. And if it's a three digit route with an odd first number, it only goes through a city like if you live in Durham or Madbury, you've got 155 or 108, okay? That only goes through Durham, only through Dover. So it's taking you right into the city. You will get there. Uh, display stop lines. We can see here where the green vehicles are going straight. We've got a lane that's turning left. Notice the stop line is different than where the uh, green vehicles are that is called the display stop line. You've got to stay away from that area uh, up near the green vehicles because there could be cars that are coming. Okay, cars that are making left hand turns from this intersection. So from the left of this picture, there will be cars coming around and turning. And if you get up too close, like with a large truck, it's just going to create a problem. Um, like I said, we were not going to get all the way through. Um, so we're going to end right there. So to end, so I know that you have been here. I want you to uh, exit out when you leave tonight. And I want you to write down the name of the term. Remember that long video about 
traffic lights. Okay, I gave you a term right after the video about knowing when lights are going to change. So I want you to sign off with that term. And I'll give you a hint. It begins with a P. All right, so sign off that you saw and you understood about traffic flow through a traffic light. And we'll finish up sign signals, pavement markings tomorrow. Um, look at chapter 12, do the questions in the textbook. We're going to talk about stopping a little bit tomorrow, and that should get us. I don't know if we'll uh, start the section on speed or not. And then we'll start next week uh, finishing up on speed and getting ready for the midterm. So that's next, next week. But remember, I downloaded, um, yeah, go to the Facebook page. I did give you a worksheet to do on what we're covering. It's not going to be due until um, after tomorrow's class, but you can do it. It's uh, Chapter 3 from Responsible Driving, it, and I've got it on the Facebook page. I think I gave you a notice about it. So uh, do that for your homework, and we'll see you tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. Stay cool.